Hey, welcome or welcome back. It is the uh, sixth and last installment of my uh, series where I challenge myself to read six contemporary poetry books. The latest one is Pagan Virtues, Stephen Dunn. This is his last book before he passed away. This came out in um, 2020. Um, he unfortunately uh, died after a long struggle with Parkinson's disease in 2021. And May 2022, last month, um, his uh, <clears throat> uh, new collection um, in his, you know, in his honor and in his uh, memory, a new collection of his poems came out called Not Yet Fallen World. Um, having read this, I would be very interested in reading, in, in getting um, Not Yet Fallen World. And so I would say to you, if after my review, you're interested to read um, his work or more of his work, I would point you in that direction. Um, but you might want, you might be one of the many um, readers around the world who, uh, who really has loved him for years and years. Um, he was born in 1939. He has written and published, you know, I think up to 20 different books, most of them poetry, some of them criticism, uh, some of them maybe essays. Um, a much loved, much, much respected um, poet and teacher. Um, and I'm extremely uh, glad that I discovered him uh, through mere serendipity, this book happened to be on the shelf of the bookstore that I was visiting at the time um, here in Sydney, Australia. Um, just to show you how the um, how wonderful it is, you know, a poetry book is published, goes out into the world, and you just really never know where in the world it's going to show up. And um, it's bringing it's um, it's been bringing me a lot of joy. Um, and also some hard work. I would say, uh, you know, there's, there's hard work involved with, in my opinion, most good poetry involves hard work by the reader. And I was thinking about that actually this morning as I was um, walking with uh, my greyhound, Augie. I was thinking, you know, why am I, why did I even challenge myself to do this? Why am I pushing myself not only to read six books in a short time and six quite you know quite challenging books but also to challenge myself to you know discuss them you know in front of a camera it's uh it's asking a lot of myself when i don't have to do it no one even gave me the idea for it, it just you know it's, it's just come from within me and uh and just now i got a series of uh, photos and videos from my brother he's uh, he's three and a half years younger than me and he is somewhere in Wyoming at the moment with a group of his friends and they're all avid cyclists. And they are challenging themselves to this uh, rather incredible off-road um, biking trip. And, uh, you know, I watch the videos and, and, and look at the photos and I see the all-encompassing enjoyment of the activity, but the challenge within each day, within certain moments of each day, they're challenging themselves physically. And uh, I think it's it's much more acceptable in our society to challenge yourself physically. But when you challenge yourself, you know, intellectually or um, artistically in this way, because I think there's an art to reading poetry books. That's what I'm discovering. I think that's a bit less, I, I feel like um, people are interested in when, when I tell them that's, a, that's what I'm doing at the moment, but there's also a sense of, um, of quiet wonder at like what, why, you know, the, this, I have a feeling that I'm way in the minority as compared to um, physical activity. Um, so that's just something that, um, I decided to bring up because, um, this book, I, I would say it's, it has, um, brought to me uh, challenges that were completely different from 
each of the other books, and especially completely different from the last book, from Joy Graham's book, Fast. And, uh, and in the reviews, yeah, I read a couple of reviews that do uh, mention the accessibility of Stephen Dunn's work. And I would say that, uh, yes, um, on first reading, it seems more um, easy or accessible, but I, I don't think it's easy poetry by any means. There's a, what, what makes it difficult is that you can't um, easily sum up what each poem is saying. And uh, as in all good poetry, it's impossible to say, what is this book about? Or what is this poem about? And um, that of course is exactly what I'm after. And, uh, and that's why I think it's a fantastic book. One of the reviews, um, the phrase they used was that this book is about mortality, morality, and the roles we play. And I think that's, um, that's actually a very good way of describing it um, to start with. I myself wrote down, when I was trying to think of um, ways I might introduce this book to you, I wrote down uh, that Stephen Dunn in this book is exploring the ideas of honesty, the truth, the phrase in all sincerity, um, which reminds me of the book called Sincerity, which uh, started off this series by uh, Duffy. The idea of illusion, the masks people wear, and a phrase he used, which I think covers it all, he's, the phrase from one of his poems is, the semblance of what feels true. I would say that is my very favorite aspect of his poetry. Um, rather than uh, bombarding uh, the reader with unexpected maximalist linguistic work as Graham did, he, he's much more specific in his poems I would say most of them uh, I would describe as short and sweet in the sense that um, there's a feeling of a hole at the end of each shortish poem. They're all about one, one to two pages long. But then there's a bittersweet edging to everything he says and a counter argument that he brings in often in the last couplet of his poems that roughens up um, the, uh, the main thesis, if you will, and brings into doubt, brings irony and brings a certain amount of cynicism into whatever is being discussed. And it is a very cerebral kind of uh, poetry even when discussing strong emotions, um, they're discussed in a uh, very logical, philosophical manner. And once you get used to that tone, it's rather addictive and you begin to see the world through Stephen Dunn's eyes. And I think the best poets do that to the reader. Even though the book is um, divided into um, four sections, I really look at it as being um, in two sections. Um, the first 25 poems and then the next 25 poems. Um, the first 25 poems are not interconnect, mostly not interconnected, although they have a similar subject matter. The, the, the second half of the book is made up of what's known as the Mrs. Cavendish poems, which is taken from an earlier book of his and has been republished here, um, which I think is fantastic. And then the bookends of these two parts of the book are what he calls postmortem guides. And uh, he was a man, you know, with Parkinson's, he'd been struggling for so many years with it and still continuing to write and, and read. So he was well aware of his own upcoming death, his own mortality. And so the, the, the first introductory poem is his postmortem guide one is 1999. 
And then at the end, the very last poem is his postmortem guide to 2018. There's a, again, a sort of bittersweet humor to them and a great wit. The first 25 poems, um, really introduce you to a certain tone of the speaker which is somewhat self-effacing and obviously an older an older speaker and an older poet speaking speaking through that speaker um it would be remiss of me not to point out that being an older poet he has certain experiences that he brings up from you know from his past that feel that they're clearly dated it's not it's not that they're dated in a negative way it's just that you feel i almost felt like some of the language came from a different time and place when america was a different time and place but then of course he has poems that uh discuss the uh, the 2016 election and um and the way he as an older white man is grappling with the way things have changed um which is which i found to be really very interesting um it was I had to try to hold myself back at certain moments from judging the speaker of the poems, um, not because anything is said or, or done in these poems that is abhorrent at all, at all, but he's not using the language that we use now when talking about politics, really. And as someone who has i've recently been looking at a lot of poets that are young and starting to write in this decade and compared to that this does seem uh somewhat old-fashioned at times but i wouldn't want to be prejudiced against that um it's just uh something you need to get used to and I would say that the second half of the book with the Mrs. Cavendish poems really confirmed what I felt, which is that while this poet is, yes, writing almost from a different era in comparison to, you know, 20 year olds, 30 year olds that are coming up through the, the poetry, American poetry world today, at the same time, it would be mistaken to judge him and not continue reading. Now, the Mrs. Cavendish poems are not at all what I expected. And I feel that they stand as a reminder to leave, for me to leave my expectations at the front, you know, at the front cover of the book. I came to this, I'm not sure why, but I, Maybe the name Cav Mrs. Cavendish, maybe the fact that I had read a tiny blurb that mentioned that it was about a unconsummated love affair, about a, 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 a speaker in the poems, a man who um, uh, loved a woman who was married but could never have her. I came to it with a certain expectation of heightened passion, uh, much, um, much heterosexual um uh, eroticism perhaps it is nothing like that and with great delicacy and almost subterfuge Stephen Dunn has managed to do a number of things in his Mrs. Cavendish poems um he called it, I was watching uh, an interview with him and he called it a novel in verse. And in a way it is, 
because you see how the relationship between the speaker and Mrs. Cavendish, his, his love or perhaps his obsession, um, how it changes through the years. But it's really, it's really much more than that. First of all, the speaker in these poems, while seeming to be sharing his innermost thoughts with me, the reader, is actually unusually reticent, hides very often in the lines of his poems, and presents Mrs. Cavendish in a way that you aren't really sure if he's a reliable narrator. And even that is not in the sense that he represents her in one way and you think she might be different. It's just that Mrs. Cavendish and the speaker and their friendship, mostly without benefits and sometimes even without the friendship, just their proximity to each other through the speaker's um, obsession with her, that all creates a world that uh, I think it's, it's a poetic world that has managed to capture, I think, what might occasionally happen if you're lucky, I suppose, in real life, when you meet someone who is, uh, whose relationship with you is impossible to define. It doesn't, it cannot be categorized. It's, it's the Mrs. Cavendish poems. <laughs> it, it's that world. So in that sense, I would even go so far as to say that the, um, the blatantly heterosexual discussion of the possibility of consummating a relationship with Mrs. Cavendish, even that feels like it's more of a fable, a sort of modern fable or allegory. And it points, I think, to something that goes beyond sex and beyond gender. And that really, that actually really surprised me because towards, you know, there's 25, I think, Mrs. Cavendish poems. And towards number 19 or 20, I suddenly I stopped reading and I put the book down and I thought to myself, I don't really know even if these poems are about a heterosexual love or obsession. I, I actually think that they're about a poet who's struggling with another part of his artistic desire. And as he is writing these poems, he he's he's actually putting on paper the the dialogue that's occurring in the artistic literary part of his creative head brain in which he's toing and froing about the meaning of life the meaning of death the way we get through uh, day at a time, the way we change from our, what he calls, you know, back in the neighborhood, because apparently he and Mrs. Cavendish knew each other back in the neighborhood, back in the day when he was young and playing basketball. And she was this very naive young woman who was, you know, who thought she knew everything when she went to university and then, you know, married this English you know, this British man and got this fantastic name, Cavendish. And I'm thinking now of some of a, of a specific poem that discusses Mrs. Cavendish's dream. Each Cap Mrs. Cavendish poem is just the best. I mean, I so highly recommend this series. Um, she has this dream. Let me find it. 
and she tells the speaker about it. And she says, oh, you were in my dream. You were a mouth, um, but you only seem to want to speak and be heard. And I really wish that you were an ear in my dream, a giant ear that would encourage me to say and say and say. And then on the telephone the next day, she concludes, she concludes by saying to the speaker that she really thinks the mouth was a poet's mouth. But the idea that uh, a poet has two sides to them, really, um, the ear and the mouth. And so as you are uh, writing, you, you know, you're, you're saying you're, that's your mouth, really. Um, and but who's your who's your your ear? You you have to then you reread your poem and you are your own ear because it's not enough to just write a poem. You go back and edit it and work on it again and again and again and sometimes for months or years. And so the poet himself, Stephen Dunn himself, is a mouth and an ear. But also as he's writing, of course, there's that imaginary reader. I mean, in this case, it's me, right? So I'm his ear. So I sort of become his Mrs. Cavendish. And he's sort of, he's sort of enticing me. So I like, you know, I am Mrs. Cavendish when I read these poems in a way, because I'm, I'm listening to what he says. And I'm reacting to it. And yes, he is flirting with me. I think a good poet does flirt with their reader. Um, and I don't mean that in a sexual way at all. I mean, you know, it's very intimate. There's very intimate moments in poetry where, I mean, it's 100% it's intimate. Um, well, that's what I love about poetry. Um, because, you know, this poet is writing his innermost thoughts and here I am thinking, oh, those perhaps are similar to my innermost thoughts or, oh, I never thought about it that way, but that's amazing. You'd never have a conversation with someone like that and that would never come up in a, you can't do that in a novel. You, you, not really. There's too many people. There's too many, there's the protagonist and there's characters and there's plot and the ration and ugh. But the poetry is real intimacy. It's just you and that page. And I love it. I, I got interrupted and it's later now. I lost all my light and um, I don't have much time. So I just wanted to uh, thank you. If you've watched this series, um, you know, it's in its entirety, Fraser Simons, I'm looking at you. You're my, um, you're my hero. Um, you know, you commented on each video and encouraged me so much. And uh, I really, you know, thank you. <laughs> um, so that was Pagan Virtues. Um, uh, if any of you would, you know, um, would like to, you know, if you think you have a favorite of my um, discussions, let me know. Um, I think it was just, a, I mean, for myself, it was the best, one of the best things I've ever done um, to do with, you know, with reading. Um, I've learned so much uh, through this um, and I, like f I look forward to many more. I wanted to finish this off uh, quicker than really necessary because um, it's Pride Month and I wanted to do something about poetry and that. So hopefully I'll be able to do that if I have time. And uh, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. And um, I want to remind you that the only real property is the property of the mind. And uh, read some poetry. Okay, bye.